Well, hello and how's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Got a little something here I put together for you. I want to start off by saying a disclaimer. In this video, I'm not, and all the information I'm giving you, I'm not trying to uh, state a theological position or come up with any theory or anything like that. I'm just sharing with you some interesting information that I found and want to put it out there and see what you think. Um, so let's get started here. I've been very interested in James uh, the Just. Um, tell you in a second why I always refer to him as James the Just. But uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking about James, uh, the brother of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let's get started with it. We'll just jump right into it. So why is he called James the Just? Well, that comes from tradition. That comes from church history. Uh, Eusebius here talks about <clears throat> talks a lot about him. It talks about how well, I'll just read it. This is uh, Church History, uh, Book Two, Chapter Twenty Three, Three to Seven. I cut off part of Section Three, um, and I just started just for for brevity here. But uh, Hegesippus, <clears throat> who lived immediately after the Apostles, gives the most accurate account in the fifth book of his memoirs. He writes as follows. James, the brother of the Lord, succeeded to the government of the church in conjunction with the apostles. He has been called the just by all from the time of our Savior to the present day. For there were many that bore the name of James. He was holy from his mother's womb. He drank no wine nor strong drink, nor did he eat flesh. No razor came upon his head. He did not anoint himself with oil, and he did not use the bath. He alone was permitted to enter into the holy place. For he wore not woolen garments, but linen garments. And he was in the habit of entering alone into the temple and was frequently found upon his knees, begging forgiveness for the people so that his knees became hard like those of a camel in consequence of his constantly bending them in his worship of God and asking forgiveness for the people. Because of his exceeding great justice, he was called the just and oblius, which signifies in Greek, bulwark of the people and justice in accordance with what the prophets declare concerning him. Now, that statement there in accordance with what the prophets declare concerning him is that's a very interesting and mysterious statement. <clears throat> well, we know this is James, the brother of Jesus. And I'll go into a little more of that. And we know he was martyred somewhere around 62 AD, about four years before the, uh, the war broke out in 66. So where do we get our, I, where do we get our information that he was the brother of Jesus? Now, of course, there's tradition that would say he's not the brother. Um, and I believe that's more because of doctrine <clears throat> than anything else. But it's clear um, we have a testimony from Paul here. This is what Paul calls him. And we know Paul is our earliest witness here. Um, Paul's writings are the earliest. They come before the Gospels. <clears throat> So we have in Galatians 1, 18 to 19. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remain with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And then in Mark 6, 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. <clears throat> in Matthew 13, 55, <clears throat> Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And then in Luke 4, 22, it just completely removes that and says, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? <clears throat> so how do we know that? Because from tradition... We learn from Eusebius, we learned that he was the bishop of the Jerusalem church, the first. He was the leader of the Jerusalem church. Well, we can see this in the canon as well. Galatians 2, 9 to 12. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I posed him to his face because he stood condemned. 
For before certain men came from James, he was eating with Gentiles, with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So it can kind of be inferred here that James was the leader from Galatians, but we get more of that in Acts. So <clears throat> can put that together and understand that even from the canon, we learn that James is the leader here in Jerusalem of the Jerusalem church. Acts 12, 17, but, mon but motioning to them with his hand to be silent. He described to them how the Lord had brought, this is when, when uh, Peter escapes from prison. And so he needs to report this uh, to James, but motioning to them with his hand to be, and, and by the way, if you're wondering, well, could this be James, James, the disciple, James, the brother of John of Zebedee? Well, it can't be in, in verse 17 here because at the beginning of Acts 12, James of Zebedee is killed by Herod. <clears throat> so after Acts 12, there's no doubt of which James this is. Uh, but, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. So he has to report this to James. So we would we could infer there that James is the leader. But uh, Acts 15 is the clearest example. This is the Jerusalem Council. When they're trying to decide, hey, what do we do with these Gentiles? Do we make them follow the law or part of it? Or what, what do we do? <clears throat> Acts 15, 13, 19. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return. And I, will, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment, this is James saying, this is my judgment. It's his judgment alone. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. And then he gives the stipulations, the 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 law the rules for the gentiles to follow not the whole law but a part of the law which we could some would say it maybe it's the the noahide law right that there could always be converts <clears throat> to judaism throughout all all of uh the history of the 12 tribes even before the split you could become a convert even in exodus you can see there's a there there can be converts the, the uh you know the uh the sojourner the stranger i forget what, how it's worded but it was always that you could become a convert um, to the Hebrew religion. And so James kind of lays out some rules here for the Gentiles. They're in this transitional period. The temple's still standing. The law is still going on. Gentiles are coming in. And so the main point, though, we all know this. You guys know. I don't even need to explain all this. But the main point is James is the one who makes the judgment here. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. And then in Acts 21, 17 through 19, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Were present. After greeting them, he re related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So Paul is coming to Jerusalem. Uh, he's received by the brothers gladly. And then on the following day, in verse 18, he goes to James with following day, Paul went in with us to James. All the elders were present. And so after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And they, they glorify God because the Gentiles are coming in. And then it goes on to having Paul um, do a sacrifice. Paul was questioned on teaching those, um, you, know, you know, not to follow the law. And so that's a Again, you all know this chapter, but the point is here is that Paul has to come. It's it's almost like he's reporting to James. Okay, so it's it's clear here from Acts that James is the leader. And so what is the lost gospel of the Hebrews? Before I read these slides, let me go there real quick. Um, and you all know that I'm I'm big on on the canon and I don't talk a lot about extra stuff, but I feel it's really helpful here and it lines up with what we have uh, in the canon. So 
what is the lost gospel of the Hebrews? Uh, the gospel of the Nazarians, observers in Hebrew, is believed to have been the Hebrew gospel of Matthew. And the source, and this is from, of course, there's different takes on this. This is early Christian writings. Um, and this is by Ed Burton H. Uh, uh, Throck Morton Jr. And the other Bible by uh, uh, Willis Barnstone. The Gospel of the Nazarians, observers in Hebrew, is believed to have been the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew and the source for the present Gospel, which was composed in Greek. That's interesting. There are reliable witnesses that this Gospel was both used and circulated among the earliest followers of Yeshua in the Diaspora. Some believe it originated in Egypt and that the latest possible date it might have been written was during the first half of the second century. However, there are other opinions that it was composed in the middle of the first century when Jesus' traditions were first being produced and collected. An earlier date is more likely than a later one. That's interesting. Jerome, Eusebius, and Hegesippus, the latter two not quoting it, make mention of it, as do Origen, Clement, both Alexandrians. It is believed to have been known to Papias, or Papias, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, who died about 130 and may have quoted it in his lost exegesis of the sayings of the Lord, which is now lost. It is significant to note that uh, Nicephorus, when drawing up his list of canonical and apocryphal books, stated that the Gospel of the Hebrews contained only 2,200 lines, 2,200 lines, 300 fewer than Matthew. It has been suggested that these 300 lines are the birth narratives of the first and second chapters of our canonical Matthew. <clears throat> Okay, so why am I talking about this? Well, just to give you an idea of of what this is, so we have it through quotes um, of those who were around at the time when it existed. We don't have any copies. But what I think is really interesting now, if it's it's later and this doesn't really this isn't really that big of a deal, but if it, it is early, and if it is the original gospel of Hebrew Matthew, well, that would it'd be really interesting how that would line up with what Paul says in first Corinthians 15, because in first Corinthians 15, uh, seven, he says, then he appeared to James, then to all the possible so Paul gives us this, uh, this witness that when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to James. He says, for I delivered to you as a first importance, what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas. Then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. And so we don't have anything in our, in our canon of Jesus appearing to James after the resurrection, but we have it in this lost gospel of Luke. So Luke 24, 50 to 53, gospel according to the Hebrews uh, in Jerome, on illustrious men also the gospel according to the hebrews recently translated by me that's the author i read you there by me into greek and latin which origin often uses so this is coming from origins quotes and from jerome i believe this is what it's saying origin often uses says after the resurrection of the savior now the lord when he had given the linen cloth to the servant of the priest went to james and appeared to him for james had sworn that he would not eat bread from that hour in which he had drunk the Lord's cup until he should see him risen from among them that sleep. And a little further on, the Lord says, bring a table and bread. And immediately it is added. He took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to James the just and said to him, my brother, eat your bread for the son of man is risen from among them that sleep. <clears throat> now, from what I can understand and what I can read, is that James the Just uh, was not one of the original disciples, and he was he was one that would have been a, a skeptic, um, from what I can read. I, we don't know of Jesus rising from the dead. And of course, if he was, he seems to be, uh, you know, he was he was allowed to go in the holy of holies. He seems to be a, a Nazar a Nazarite where he was very strict uh, follower of the law. So maybe, uh, I mean, I don't want to infer anything, but. It, it, it could make sense that he wouldn't believe uh, in the, the, the resurrection, um, just like some of the other disciples did, because 
it just wasn't clear um, in, in the law um, from his, his tradition that he was following. But after Jesus rises from the dead, uh, at some point, he becomes the leader. So, again, could James be the beloved disciple? Uh, this verse here, John 18, 15 to 16. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant, servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So this is interesting. We know that James, later on in his life, before he's killed, he's that well-revered. Uh, that he can go into the holy place, um, according to Eusebius there. So it would seem that he was a strict follower of the law, and it would make sense that someone like him uh, would have been known to the high priest, especially with this family line. If we understand that Jesus' family was descended from King David, um, he would also be in that line. So this this one was always uh, I know this idea of Lazarus and it's big. David Curtis uh, did a big video. I know it's 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 a popular view out there <clears throat> in our world, um, but I'm not sure this Lazarus uh, is a, is a code name or it's uh, it's maybe it's 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 maybe there's something more than just this unknown Lazarus. So uh, this episode when Peter, who's a Galilean. Um, is not able to go in, um, but this other disciple is known to the high priest. I think that would have to be somebody very important. And it seems that James is very important. How does he become the leader uh, later on, um, you know, after Jesus' resurrection? How does he become the leader? Well, maybe he was well-known. Maybe he was, uh, I, I don't know. There's a lot you could infer here, but I would think that somebody... That's that's focused on as the other disciple here. He's known to the high priest. I think he would have to be somebody pretty important rather than just an unknown and unnamed. Um, Paul calls Peter, James, and John the pillars. He separates them out. Um, so obviously it's not Peter, but Peter's here. Uh, could it have been John? Maybe John is writing this. So there you got the three pillars. You got You got Peter who's here. You got John that's writing it and the other disciple. Well, I guess that will make sense. I'm thinking out loud because the other disciple is the one who wrote this. So I don't know if it makes sense that James would be the author of this gospel. But these are just some things that I am thinking about and studying. I told you I'm in, uh, I'm in research mode. So I'm just sharing my research with you. Again, I'm not trying to make any points here. I'm just giving you some some sharing my sharing some things I, I found that I think are interesting. I think there's just way more to uh, James the Just and this relationship, and you know how this how this original this Jerusalem church, which Eusebius also tells us they they were they would have fled to Pella um, during the invasion, but James would have been would have passed away by them. I think there's a lot to learn here. It's just, it fascinates me. So I wanted to share it. So anyway, that's all I got. I'll talk to you soon. Enjoy the, uh, or have a good week coming up here, getting back to the work week. So I hope you, everyone has a great week. I will talk to you soon. Go in peace, serve the Lord. God bless.